things worsen when you think today's story is at its max intensity. Mountaineer Tomac's never quit attitude allows him to do the unthinkable, but unfortunately, things go very wrong for him. Tomek Maskerich, 43, was born in a small town in Poland. His early childhood was rough, and he wanted to escape from daily life, which is why the outdoors became an obsession for him. He disliked everything about the city, including the noise, trash, and the number of people. But most of all, he hated the lack of access to the outdoors. Tomek felt he had no reason to live, but one day he decided to change his life and checked himself into a rehab at age 18. For two years, Tomac did odd jobs and stayed away from drugs. He packed up all of his belongings and then moved to Warsaw, the capital of Poland. He had a lot to do in this city and he quickly met many new friends, and through one of those friends he met Joanna, whom he eventually married. But even though he was quote, doing all of the right things, he could not shake the feeling of emptiness and a lack of purpose. He needed an escape and decided to travel to India to experience a culture entirely unlike anything he had ever experienced before. He camped in the north of India for a few nights and he made it his next goal to climb one of the mountains in the Himalayas. First, he went back to Poland, married Joanna, and then he moved to Ireland and he created a plan to one day tackle the Himalaya mountains. Tomac began putting all of his efforts into training for the climb, and he did his best to meet as many climbers and mountaineers as possible. He eventually ran into a Polish mountaineer named Marek Klanowski. Marek talked about how he tried to climb Mount Logan in Canada solo, and Tomac told him that he would go there with him next time. Preparing for the climb consumed Tomac, and he quickly became noticed in the climbing community in Ireland. By trial and error, Tomek learned everything by himself without ever attending any courses, climbing schools, or doing anything else. Marek was impressed with how serious Tomek was taking the work up for the trip and finally agreed to climb Mount Logan with him in the spring. Marek knew that climbing with someone without any experience was risky, but he decided that fate brought Tomek into his life and he was happy to have him as a friend. They successfully climbed Mount Logan in May 2008. It took them 40 days, and as a result, they won an international climbing award for their efforts. When Tomek was presented with the award, a rush went through his entire body, and he knew that he finally found his life purpose. He went on to solo climb Khan Tengri on the border of China, Kyrgyzstan, and Kazakhstan. He was ready to try the most challenging mountains in the world, and the next logical step for him was to enter the Himalayas. Tomac's sights fell on Nanga Parbat, and he asked Merrick to join him for a perilous and challenging winter ascent. Nanga Parbat is one of the tallest peaks on the planet and is located in the Himalaya mountain system in Pakistan. It is commonly known as the Killer Mountain due to its high fatality rate. The mountain has a daunting ascent, and even in the summer months, it is imperiled by unstable glaciers, avalanches, and intense storms. Since the first disastrous British expedition, led by A.F. Mummer, mountaineers have tried to ascend Nanga Parbat summit through different routes, but few lucky ones have succeeded. The mountain was brought to greater fame after the climbing of Reinhold Messner in 1970. Unfortunately, Reinhold's brother Gunther died on the ascent. The south face is the largest in the world, extending over 4 kilometers above base camp. To date, there have only been 5 ascents from the south. In terms of technical difficulty, this mountain competes with K2. Nanga Parbat consists of 20 kilometer long series of peaks and ridges accumulating in an ice crest that's 8,125 meters. Tomac and Marak were attracted to Nanga Parbat because it was one of the only remaining 8,000 meter peaks yet to be climbed in the winter. The reason for that is that attempting the summit of this mountain in the winter was dangerous and everything had to go right in the climb for them to survive. Their first attempt didn't go very well and they had to turn back before making it to the summit. The following year they did better but they still didn't reach the top. The year after that, they tried again, but Marek had an issue with the climb and Tomac decided he would just climb the rest of the mountain himself and he was able to make it to one of the lower peaks on Nanga Parbat. 
At this point, Tomek's marriage to Joanna had fallen apart after the death of their son. However, in Ireland, Tomek met his second wife, Anna, and they soon had a child, whom they raised along with a son from Anna's previous relationship. After that last trip, Mark decided that he was done climbing Nanga Parbat. It was simply just not worth the risk for him, and he split ways with Tomek. Without Marek, Tomek decided he'd climb the mountain himself and do it the way he always wanted to, which was alpine style, fast, light, and without setting up the multiple camps filled with supplies. While preparing for his next attempt at Nanga Parbat, he met Elizabeth Revel, an excellent mountaineer with an impressive mountaineering resume. She was on the French national climbing team when she met Tomek. Elizabeth is younger than Tomac and his complete opposite, but they quickly became friends. They were very different though, as he was loud and expressive and she was quiet and very reserved. Before she did any climbing with Tomac, she attempted to reach the summit of Annapurna with Martin Minarek, a Czech mountaineer. They were able to reach the east summit, but they were turned back from the main peak by hurricane level winds. Unfortunately, on their descent, Martin and Elizabeth separated when a storm hit them and Martin disappeared forever. Elizabeth somehow made it back down the mountain and survived, but she was severely injured from the extreme cold. Martin's death was a big blow to Elizabeth and it put her in a bad mental space. She could not climb again for years until she worked up enough courage and motivation with the help of her friend Tomac. Tomac and Elizabeth then teamed up for another attempt to summit in the winter of 2016. But bad weather kept them from making it to the peak, and Tomac was getting extremely frustrated that he had to turn back once again. He made it public that he would not give up climbing Nanga Parbat until he had successfully summited the highest peak. Tomac and Elizabeth made it to the Nanga Parbat base camp at the start of winter, December 23rd, 2017. For Tomac, it was his seventh attempt. For Elizabeth, it was her fourth. About one month later, they began their push to the summit on January 21st, 2018. They worked their way along the northwest face, but then angled right, eventually reaching the Kinshafer route, which they followed to the summit. They reached their first camp, Camp 2, with no issues and settled in for the night. Unfortunately, it was very windy that night, making it so they had to take a break from climbing until the weather got better. They stayed at camp for another day because the weather was so horrible that it would have been a death trap if they continued to climb. They then began to traverse right towards the Austrian-Canadian route on the northwest buttress. They ran into extreme winds, which forced them to stop for the night at a sheltered spot at about 6,900 meters. This was turning out to be one of the most challenging attempts for both Elizabeth and Tomac. The next day, they continued, but they had to make their own route because of an avalanche risk. They spent the night in a tent in a crevasse at about 7,300 meters. On the next day, January 25th, they could make it back to the Kinshofer route and start the final ascent. They made it up to 8,035 meters, but it was late in the day and there would soon be no sunlight. They discussed whether to continue, but Tomac would not turn back, and they decided to continue to summit and made it to the top. The pair had completed the second winter ascent of Nanga Parbet, and Elizabeth became the first woman to summit the mountain in the winter. She shouted and gave Tomac a huge hug. She then noticed ice crystals on his eyes, which was concerning. The extreme wind blinded Tomac, and he could no longer see. Elizabeth knew what this meant. Blindness is a symptom of acute mountain sickness, a condition that can ultimately lead to death. She needed to get him to a lower elevation so that he could get more oxygen into his system. Realizing the gravity of the situation, Elizabeth forced herself into survival mode. She then placed Tomac's left hand on her right shoulder and they began their descent. But as soon as they left the summit, she realized that Tomac was getting slower and slower and soon he could barely move. By the time they had hiked down just to under 8,000 meters or just below the so-called death zone, when his face mask came loose, Elizabeth saw blood flowing from his mouth and his nose was white with frostbite. At about 11 p.m., she pulled out her satellite phone and sent a text to three people, her husband, Tomac's wife, and Elizabeth's friend, Ludovic Giambasi. She requested rescue and clarified that she and Tomac were in grave danger. 
Rescuers are not on standby for rescue on a mountain of this magnitude. Any rescue attempt is hazardous, and the rescuers know going into it that they are risking their own lives to save another. Elizabeth helped Tomek continue to get down the mountain, and they got as low as they could. He was in horrible shape and seemed to be barely alive. She had to stay mentally strong to get both of them off the mountain. At just below 7,315 meters, she built a temporary shelter and sent another text. This time, it was a desperation text and she believed their fate had already been sealed. While all of this was happening, another winter expedition was underway roughly 115 miles to the northeast. A Polish expedition was about 6,309 meters up K2, attempting to make the first winter ascent of that mountain. News of the trouble on Nanga Parbet reached them via satellite internet. Krzysztof Javicki realized that the only rescue option for Elizabeth and Tomek was to fly his climbing team to Nanga Parbet and rescue them. Krzysztof then asked the 13 climbers at the K2 base camp if any of them were willing to interrupt their summit push to rescue the two stranded climbers. Every single one of them said yes. The climbers joined him to form the rescue team, Adam Bailecki, Dennis Urbuko, Piotr Tomala, and Jarosław Botor. They were ready and willing to do whatever they could to save Elizabeth and Tomek. They would be on a daring mission, and there was little chance of success, but they knew that they had to do it. Adam, 34, climbed Khan Tingri when he was 17. He has also summited four 8,000 meter peaks, including two in the winter. Dennis, 45, has 19 ascents of 8,000 meter peaks to his name. The two men are among the boldest and best climbers in the world. More importantly, both were familiar with the Nanga Parbet route Tomek and Elizabeth were stranded on. They had each tried it separately, Dennis in the summer of 2003 and Adam in the winter of 2015 and 16. They started running into issues, the helicopters were delayed, and the politics were slowing down the rescue team's coordination. Some said that the delay was due to the cost between the Polish and French embassies and the Pakistan army and the climber's insurance company. Finally, a miracle happened and one of Elizabeth's friends started a fundraising campaign to help pay for the expenses to get the rescue back on track. Two helicopters finally arrived at the K2 base camp at 1 p.m. on January 27th and picked up the four rescuers, and then they went to Nanga Parbat. The reality of the situation started to set in for the rescuers as they looked out of the small helicopter windows. They had no training in mountain rescue, and they really didn't know if they were going to find Tomac and Elizabeth. It was going to be almost impossible. Finding the mountain, let alone a place to land, was not easy. The pilots had never been there, so when they came closer, Dennis showed them where the base camp was located and where they needed to land. The pilots planned to fly the helicopter as high as they could on the mountain and then drop the rescuers off. The issue is that the higher the helicopters fly, the more unstable they become because they were not designed to fly to those altitudes. The pilots dropped off the rescuers at 5.10 p.m. on a small rocky platform just below Camp 1 at an elevation of approximately 4,800 meters, as high as the helicopters could go. The team decided that Piotr and Yaroslav would stay at the landing site while Adam and Dennis would climb. They began their ascent at 5.30 p.m. To reach the pair, the rescuers began climbing Kinshofer's Cooler, a steep gully filled with ice that leads up to a 100 meter rock wall. They both had a lot of adrenaline running through them, which helped them get off to a good start. They pulled out their ice axes when they hit the ice wall and kept climbing. They were lucky to encounter fields of fern, an intermediate stage between snow and glacial ice that is easier to climb. The two were climbing simultaneously, often without anchors. They didn't place a single ice screw during the climb. In roughly 1,280 meters of climbing, they used only 10 placements, effectively climbing unprotected on one of the world's most difficult climbs at altitude in the winter. They were not taking any of the usual precautions when climbing, which led them exposed to danger every second they were on the mountain. They had to move quickly to make it up to Tomac and Elizabeth before they both froze. The two rescuers averaged approximately 150 meters per an hour. This is something that was almost never done, but these guys could do it. They had spent a night on K2, so they were already acclimatized. 
but the clock was still ticking. Elizabeth and Tomek had been stranded on a makeshift shelter for two days. The craziest thing about this rescue is that the two climbers had no idea where Tomek and Elizabeth were. They were moving up the mountain as fast as they could, and they hoped that they could catch some sort of trail leading to Tomek and Elizabeth. They didn't know if the two people they were trying to rescue were already dead and they were risking their lives for nothing. By midnight, more than six hours into their climb, Dennis was leading the way and they came to a point in the climb where it was extremely challenging and technical. They were starting to get tired and if anything terrible happened to them, they suspected it would happen here. But they made it past and sheltered at Camp 2. Adam and Dennis had no luck finding a trail to locate Tomac and Elizabeth and needed a miracle to find them. They both felt that shouting as they climbed would be the best bet because they could have easily climbed right past Tomek and Elizabeth without seeing them. They shouted through the wind and the snow. Suddenly, Adam was not sure if he was going crazy or if he heard a faint shout from far away. He then went towards the sound and sure enough, he spotted Elizabeth in the snow. Dennis could not believe his eyes, and all sorts of emotions rushed over him as he realized Tomek was nowhere in sight. It was 1.50 a.m. She was all alone, dehydrated and frostbitten. She was able to stay alive by spending the previous night sheltered in a crevasse with just her harness, no repelling device, no carabiner, and not even a headlamp. With no equipment, Elizabeth couldn't make it down the Ken Chauffeur wall safely she would have died on the mountain without any assistance from rescuers. The night before, she hallucinated a symptom of high altitude sickness. Elizabeth believed that someone had brought her tea and that the woman asked her for her boot in exchange. At that moment, she took off her shoe and gave it to her. That next morning, she was only wearing her sock when she woke up. Adam and Dennis did their best to make her more comfortable. First, they gave her some gloves and then helped her set up a temporary camp to shelter her from the blistering cold. They turned their attention to the whereabouts of Tomac. First, they asked her where Tomac was. Elizabeth said he could not move, so she had to leave him in a crevasse at a makeshift camp. This was devastating news to Adam and Dennis, and they knew that they had to make a horrible decision. They had to decide if they were going to try to get Tomac and rescue him or get Elizabeth back down the mountain. They understood that if they left Elizabeth and went up for Tomac, she would die. And even if they reached Tomac and he was still alive, they would not be able to save him if he could not walk. So they had to make the heartbreaking decision to not attempt to rescue Tomac. At dawn, Adam, Dennis, and Elizabeth began to ascend, even though Elizabeth couldn't move her hands. The two men built a system where Dennis lowered her on a rope and then Adam repelled next to her on a second rope, connected to Elizabeth with a sling. Then, Adam would build a belay stance with ice screws and secure Elizabeth and let Dennis repel down to join him. They did this every 40 meters the whole way down, switching leads every 4 hours. This was absolutely exhausting and they were losing energy fast. At 11.30 a.m., approximately 18 hours after arriving, Adam and Dennis reached the helicopters with Elizabeth. They finally made it and the miracle came true. In the following weeks, Elizabeth was transferred from Islamabad to a hospital in France where she was treated for frostbite. Then, the Polish climbers returned to K2 where they waited a month and a half for good weather to try and ascend, but they ultimately just turned back. Elizabeth said that Tomek was a great man with a huge heart, even bigger than hers, and he was an incredible person. Mara Klonowski misses his friend and longtime climbing partner. Tomek was condemned by many mountaineers for climbing with no formal training, not using the correct type of ropes, and without using enough safety precautions. Rescuer Adam Bilecki says Tomek was a pro and he couldn't believe he climbed Nanga Parbat in the winter. He said that that is an incredible achievement and he also mentioned that Tomek had the right to play the game according to his rules. His strategy was completely different than anyone else, but Adam respected that. A French politician asked the French president to award the rescue team with the Legion of Honor, the highest civilian award in the country. Still, the rescuers did not want to accept the recognition. Adam doesn't think that they did anything extraordinary and that every climber must help other climbers. I want to say thanks for watching the video and don't forget to subscribe if you like the content. As always, please be nice to the like button and I have many other disaster videos on my channel that you might want to check out. See you at the next one.